you so much for your talk. I've uh, read your articles in Foreign Affairs before. Uh, in the readings assigned, you mentioned the role of cyber strategy in countering disinformation. Uh, my question is, who decides what constitutes disinformation, and how do you uh, prevent those entities from violating First Amendment freedoms? Oh, this is complicated. Um, this is a really, really difficult question, which I, I think the, the federal government has been struggling with how to deal with this. So this actually has had a big impact rate on the Department of Defense. So I love the Department of Defense. They're like a really, really good bureaucratic player. So when they see something that um, would potentially like increase their budget and authorities, they're like on it, you know? So disinformation, they saw it and they're like, yeah, I see you. I think we can do that. We can take that. And so there was a whole conversation about what the Department of Defense's um, role would be in combating disinformation. And the, the roadblock that came up was, what is disinformation? What role does the Department of Defense have in policing what many of these activities turned out to be, you know, either from, there's a lot of seeds that are domestic, but also interact very closely with domestic. So even if it starts from a foreign government, they, it immediately interacts with the domestic. Um, and so what role should the DOD have in that? And I think actually they stepped the DOD back quite a bit because as soon as you start grappling that with that question, you start grappling with a much more uncomfortable question about what role the military should play in determining what is truth when it comes to domestic um, politics. So I think the move has been to focus more on uh, CISA and DHS. Um, but I, they're, still, they're still figuring out what the lines in the road are for disinformation. I will say, I think under the Trump administration, um, there was a bit of, I don't know if they were agnostic or didn't want to jump into it or actively didn't believe they should, but they left it up to social media. And each one of these social media companies all came up with their own version of what combating disinformation meant. And so you ended up with this, I mean, as a social scientist, it was like a natural experiment <laughs> of like what works and what doesn't. And I think we got more what doesn't than what does. Then the Biden administration comes in and they thought, okay, it's time for the federal government to take those lessons learned and see if we can come up with a federal government strategy. And they've, they've struggled. Um, it's become politicized. It's extremely, extremely difficult. So I don't have a good answer for you. But to say that I think that they, they recognize it's a very hard question. Because of that, there has not been a lot of forward movement on it. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. That was super informative. Um, so I know you walked us through a lot of kind of the history of the different kind of bureaus that manage um, cybersecurity and how that's evolved over the years. I know the government was a little bit late to the game in terms of like recognizing cybersecurity as an emerging field. Like the first kind of actual mention of like a structural position, I believe, was in like 1998 with the National Coordination Counterterrorism and Cybersecurity Infrastructure, or something. Um, but I know that like in terms of the Department of um, Defense, there's been a lot of fluctuation in terms of the like delegation of power in between administrations. I know that in like more democratic administrations under like Obama, it was much more centralized um, and then it was much more decentralized under Trump and has remained more centralized under Biden. Um, and I was wondering if this like kind of flip flop or back and forth of, of um, centralization and just like who has power is beneficial because it allows us to deal with like these issues in a more flexible way and also kind of try these different approaches, especially as the field of cybersecurity evolves so incredibly quickly. Um, or if you think that a more kind of structured and permanent approach would be more beneficial because then we could figure out like who specifically, what departments are dealing with what issues, because as you mentioned, there's a domestic interest and then also an international interest. Yeah, great question. Um, and here's where I think actually, I would commend the US government. I think there's a decent amount of learning that has occurred here. Um, as you said, under the Obama administration, extremely centralized. Under the Trump administration, extremely decentralized. Then you get to the Biden administration and the question is what are they gonna do? 
And I actually wrote a like op-ed or two at the time because there were rumors circulating that they were going to go back to the highly centralized authorities that um, that the uh, Obama administration had put in effect. But I actually, here we can see learning. They didn't. Um, they took the authorities that had been created by the um, the Trump administration and. I think they tweaked around the edges, but they largely stuck with delegation of many authorities to Cyber Command. And so here's an example where the kind of general, like the Trump administration kind of ignoring cyber ends up being kind of beneficial because you end up learning a lot. And so you can see across these three administrations a lot of learning. And one of the commendations I would say is that the reason why you can see this kind of learning across administrations and they are able to update but not update to dogmatic standards is because this, this issue is so boring that it's generally bipartisan. So like, nobody cares. You know, like my, my like aunt, she, she has no idea. Like she just wants to get on her computer. Like she's not mad at Biden. She's not mad at Trump. She's not mad at Obama. Like who cares? And that can be really helpful. So you have these like ability to cross um, party lines. The legislation that came out of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission I mean, this is, I mean, it's a commendation to the executive director, Mark Montgomery. His ability to take those recommendations and turn them into legislation is a how-to book on how to turn a commission into policy. And part of why he was able to do that was because you had Gallagher and you had Langevin, and they were able to work hand in hand. Um, and I think because cyber has been kind of ignored um, by the general population, that we're able to see learning across administrations. If Biden had come in and done exactly what Obama did and decided this is the democratic president way is we're gonna do this, then that would have been, um, that would not have been good learning. But here we see um, an administration that, actually there were a bunch of people from the Obama administration, so they maybe would have tended, but they looked at the evidence, they saw what had occurred, and decided, hey, we don't actually see signs of escalation. We see that we can have these more um, relaxed authorities, and the DOD does use it professionally, and we're able to, you know, tweak those rules based on learning, and um, so I think one for the U.S. government. Hi, thanks a lot for the excellent uh, talk. Um, my question sort of relates to this idea of what cyber operations really are. Mm -hmm. um, and you hinted on, uh, at that with one of your mentions on a slide of cyber as an intelligence context, a contest. So I understand there's this debate in the literature of whether cyber ops are usually a tool of intelligence gathering or covert operations rather than state competition and, and effects in that manner. So what might that debate mean for US um, cyber strategy, um, and especially for working with allies um, in that space to perhaps do joint operations or something like that? Yeah, so I think, um, so I'm gonna paraphrase. I think your question, the question is about like, is cyber primarily a tool of intelligence and um, a gray zone and uh, something fundamentally different than uh, kinetic weapons? Or does cyber can be cyber can cyber be analogous to things like bombs and missiles? Is that about right? Um, and I think we really wanted it to be bombs and missiles at first. I mean, you should read their early stuff from I mean, brilliant people, right? But they were writing things in foreign affairs that were like cyber Armageddon, cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber 9/11, and we were going to cyber nuke people, and it just wasn't what happened. But the focus on this, the focus on created making cyber look like a bomb really took, was a big distraction. It took a lot of our time and effort. I mean, both in terms of like weapons acquisition and the way we organize the Department of Defense and also kind of like as a scholar, there's a lot of bad stuff about that, really bad. Cyber is, and like, you, you know, just like a lot of analogies. And we wasted a lot of time doing this kind of cyber analogy thing. Um, but going back to the correct cyber analogy, it probably is more like intelligence. Right, cyber is about information fundamentally. It doesn't look like a bomb, but information is important. And the way it affects strategic outcomes is important. And so reframing towards that 
cyber as information instead of how cyber creates a physical effect is very useful in terms of thinking about how we acquire systems, um, how we build out systems, how we build out capabilities. We actually have a very limited amount of cyber capabilities within the Department of Defense. That's generally not a technology problem, that's a manpower problem. We don't have enough people. So you have to decide, are my people doing cyber as bombs? Are my people doing cyber as information? Um, and I think the focus initially was to make it look like a weapons package. And now it is more and more looking about how you integrate cyber across all levels of warfare, recognizing that it's more information and less a bomb. Oh. Um, hi, thank you so much. I find this fascinating, so oh, it's good. not boring to me. Good. Um, but based on the more recent instances, and I'm going to put it kindly and say misuses of confidential information by government officials, um, how would you suggest that we prevent the human ignorance factor, as I like to call it, um, from weakening us from the inside, especially with our sources and methods? Oh, so you mean like the disclosure of cyber information? Yeah, like the spreading of like how we get our intel, where it's coming from, what we're using it for, things like that. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a nice way of doing this, which is like it's called the um, Intel Ops uh, trade-off, right? So there's a trade-off between um, information and holding onto that information for sources and methods versus using that information to achieve an operational effect. Um, I think if you look at kind of the early the early stages of the Russian invasion in Ukraine and how the Biden administration revealed information there, you see maybe a good example of somebody of like a process that thought through, we should reveal this even if it gives up some means um, because it's it helps. Um, where it's going to be less effective is when we're looking at leaks, you know, or. Um, I mean, Snowden probably was the biggest uh, impact on US uh, technical intelligence maybe ever. Um, so that kind of insider information where they're sharing, um, sharing sensitive information for classified reasons or when they're using um, classified information in order to uh, shape domestic politics can be really, um, really damaging. The challenge is how you restrict that information. When there's so much information, how do you determine who has a need to know? Is it the airman uh, in Cape Cod? Does he need it? <laughs> you know, that's, it actually is like really difficult when you have a giant bureaucracy. So I think on one level you have strategic decisions about whether, whether, whether presidents are making the right strategic decision about what to classify and declassify. And on the other hand, you have a, like a series of bureaucratic choices about how you keep security within the like realm of pro within professionals, and that is hard because you're basically trading off efficiency and effectiveness for security. And how do you do that? Um, so I think it's it's going to be an ongoing challenge for those in the cyber field. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming out today. I'm sure we all appreciated it. I was just curious, you know, as it, uh, is often the case when dealing with state-to-state -state relations, you know, what is going to be the line and what is going to be kind of the standard for cybersecurity? We obviously don't want to see a scenario where, you know, everybody's attacking everyone with cyberspace. So how do you, are you optimistic about or do you have any sort of, you know, preliminary, or has the government perhaps developed some, it's a new technology, pre preliminary standards for what is the range and scope of um, cyber attacks and of the information you can get using uh, cyber attacks. Yeah, I think this is a, a norm that is constantly in flex, right? So um, for me, <laughs> I actually think that like the vast majority of cyber attacks um, may be inappropriate but not illegal or like inappropriate but not reach the threshold of war. Um, but uh, what that norm is and whether there are red lines is really contested. And each administration takes a different approach. The Biden administration, for example, I thought it was very interesting. The, the Chinese did a massive cyber exploitation through a Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, um, coming off the heels of a, a Russian exploit into um, a piece of hardware that huge amounts of information, right? For me, I saw that and I was like, hmm. Like, touche Russia, touche China. Like, not good for us, but also, like, I wish we had done the same thing. Like, these were completely, to me, appropriate versions of spying. The Biden administration came out and said these are not appropriate because they were too big in scale. I thought, well, that's kind of a hard norm. 
Um, so for me, I think that there is, there is definitely, um, when attacks by state actors have a physical effect on civilians, that's a no-no. Like, and I think too often we make this too complicated. So Biden came out and was like, okay, we don't attack critical infrastructure and here's the 16 critical infrastructures and here's how we think about them. And it was, it was really convoluted. And I thought, no, 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 you just come out and you say, I'm not going to attack your civilians. I'm not gonna cause physical harm to your civilians. Like that's not appropriate outside of war, it's not appropriate in war. It's clear, right? Just say the same thing in cyber. So if you are attacking a hospital and that is causing people to die, that is inappropriate and potentially could cause war or you're justifiable. And I think if we take it to like that simple level, it, like fundamentally it's about humans and whether you're creating like, the, the threshold to me is violence against humans and violence against civilians in particular. And um, military combatants are a more legitimate target um, even outside of war. So they're working on it. They're definitely not clear enough. I, I was actually really hopeful that the defense cyberspace strategy would come out because I thought they might be trying to tackle this a little bit. I was, but I, it still hasn't been released, so I'm not sure where they're gonna go. Maybe that's why it hasn't been released. It's like still being, uh, still considered too contentious. Um, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Um, so you emphasize that uh, cyber operations do not lead to, uh, do not escalate to violence in real life with the evidence taken from the case of Ukrainian war. And I'm just wondering if it could be different in other cases. Uh, so for example, you're probably aware that um, the main source of North Korean government budget is by their hackers, um, sure. you know, stealing cryptocurrencies. Um, and this stolen money could be used for developing like stronger and more number of nuclear weapons, uh, which could be actually used for threatening the US or you know, South Korea, Japan. Um, so what are your thoughts on it? So that's true. You're right. The, um, it's actually a, a remarkable uh, strategy by the North Koreans using ransomware attacks in order to fund their ballistic missile and nuclear program. Um, but so far, that doesn't, that has not, that's not a direct, I wouldn't say that's a direct effect to violence. When I'm saying that you don't see cyber effects lead to, to violence, I mean a direct. So if that cyber attack that North Korea is conducting, that ransomware attack, has not led the United States to uh, launch a physical attack against North Korea. And why? Because in the end, the physical uh, components of deterrence, missiles, nuclear weapons, artillery, deter the United States from taking any attack against the North Koreans that's not in the cyber domain or economic. So in the end, even though this cyber thing has strategic implications, the limit, the foreign policy options that America has is limited by deterrence of big physical objects. So I think that's kind of where it comes back to is that in the end, if you're You'll use cyber if you're all ready to go to physical, cyber to create violence, if you're already using physical weapons to go to physical, to go to violence. One more question. Okay. Um, so as the United States military moves into like um, multi-domain operations, um, do you, like how effective is the um, like new doctrines being written, like adopted by, you know, across echelon, or do you see like bureaucratic politics at play where some services are like less or like not inclined to adopt um, to a focus to cyberspace? Yeah, I mean, right now multi-domain operations is like a, it's a buzzword. Um, what that means in practice is still um, really varies. <laughs> um, so I think it would be hard I think the services are, like you pointed out, they're still in a series of bureaucratic fights, not only about how that much they integrate cyber, but like how they think about building their digital infrastructure to actually do multi-domain battle. Um, I think they're, that each services approaches cyber in their kind of service identity way. So the army is probably closest to thinking about cyber as a part of their core war fighting units, and you have cyber embedded inside of like infantry, artillery, that kind of, 
you think about it as it relates to ground operations. For the Air Force, cyber becomes a weapons platform, just analogous to an aircraft. But they are also thinking about embedding cyber with cyber like defense specialists within core warfighting units, like within kind of fighter wings, for example. You have a cyber person that does vulnerability and weapon systems. That would be an advancement. And then the Navy, um, in the, Na the Navy, um, you, you've seen the same kind of, like you have these divisions between surface warfare, undersea warfare, um, and the aviators, and like figuring out where cyber goes in these kind of subcategories that are so important to how the Navy develops. So bottom line is, each service is bringing its own kind of service identity to their development of cyber. And actually, if you're really interested in this question, I recommend you email uh, Erica Lonergan and Jack Snyder at Columbia University because they have a paper looking directly at how strategic culture which is within the services affects how they allocate cyber resources. So. Yeah.